Captain Foley and Commander Cockings here, guys. Hello, everyone. Again, always. Very welcome back. Today is a very exciting day over here at Trek Yards as we are doing something new. This is our first ever episode of Trek Yards Originals, where we take a fan created ship design and flesh it out completely to give you all the specs, details, history, and complete story of it with that very special Trek Yards polished look. Today we have with us Michael Freitas. Freitas? I'm Michael. Freitas. Freitas. Hey there. Hey. Uh, a friend of mine who designed and constructed the topic of today's episode, the Terror Bird, a motion picture era Romulan vessel. Looks nice over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, this design is completely original and something none of you have ever seen before because Michael, and because Michael donated to the Indiegogo campaign, Thanks, Michael. he gets. You're welcome. <laughs> he gets to not only have his ship featured on our show, but also gets to join us on screen to discuss it. So welcome, Michael. It's nice to have such a talented, creative person as yourself joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. So yeah, welcome to the show, Michael. Uh, I just can't wait to make official all the stuff we've been talking about for, for quite a while now. You know, give the ship life and, and a place in the Trek universe. It's going to be great. So thanks, guys. A real pleasure to be here. Let's get right into the, the Terror Bird uh, from a basic standpoint. Uh, it is a stealth strike cruiser, also known as the Terror Bird class. Uh, this ship has an interesting past, having been both a Romulan Star Empire construction and then a Tal Shiar secret project. First, a Romulan military cruiser, but when the Tal Shiar saw potential in its design, they had the project officially cancelled, but continued development in secret at one of their covert research facilities, and all records of its design were erased. So the Tal Shiar then commissioned three of these now stealth strike cruisers as part of their move back into the galactic stage just like what they did with the prototype Warbird in Baz Terra. Um, this ship was now designed to infiltrate enemy space, observe and then destroy any enemy asset that was considered a threat to the Roman Empire. Each of these three vessels had a specific enemy region to infiltrate, you know, testing the galaxy once again. But since we didn't officially see the Romans until TNG, I think it's fair to say something went wrong, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Yeah. The ship's R&D was about a year under the original military contract before being shut down by the Tal Shiar, who then altered the original space frame, and after about another two and a half years of development and construction in a hidden Tal Shiar asteroid base, the first of its class was launched in 2294. Part of its development was done so it could outmatch the new Federation flagship, the USS Enterprise 1701B, which was launched less than a year before. So additions made by the Tal Shiar Tactical Research Division uh, included two independent low-power cloaking devices, uh, the ability for the ship to separate in an emergency, uh, and then it could partially reintegrate, but because of the complex nature of it, um, it required a starbase or repair facility to really bring about to, uh, fighting capacity, uh, additional armour, and it replaced the more conventional warp engines with special retractable armoured ones, which we'll talk about later. Unlike previous Romulan ships, this vessel was designed as a stealth cruiser with a serious punch. A larger ship with more power allowed the cloaking device to be active with enough power available for other systems, even active at warp. The Terror Bird had a number of different flight modes, stealth mode being one of them, which turned off all non-essential systems with both cloaking generators working in conjunction. This meant that almost no radiation could escape that could be detected. Uh, part of this was the new improved warp engine configuration. So by having the warp coils inside the ship and its hull armor meant that almost no power emissions could be detected from the warp drive. And this made the, the ship even more effective at cloak. Uh, yeah, and this combined with the brand new uh, special hull plating, which was uh, used for the ship. It wasn't as effective as conventional armor in, in stopping uh, energy weapons, which wasn't its purpose, but it was designed to reduce all other emissions by a further 25%. So in stealth mode, the ship was almost undetectable, but still incredibly effective, even with weapons charged and at low warp. So let's give the, a sense of scale here. This was a fairly large ship compared to the other ships of the era, at 480 meters long, with the Enterprise B measuring in at 469 meters. As we can see from the animation next to us, <laughs> it was... <laughs> it fits in between the, the original series-style Romulan ship and a larger Romulan warbird of the next generation, showing that this was the beginning of their development of larger ships. The Terrorbird class has 25 decks and a crew complement of around 500 personnel, with at least half of them being highly trained strike operatives, which specialized in planetary or boarding party surgical strikes. 
Yeah, part of the ship's development was the installation of a brand new warp core design, and the Terrorbird was the test bed for this new innovation. This was the Romulan's first attempt to move away from the traditional matter antimatter warp core design and involved either harnessing directly or artificially generating soliton radiogenic isotopes that are found in the very heart of stars and infusing those directly into the warp, warp core reaction. So this was the Romulan's first step towards the artificial singularities that we see powering TNG era Romulan ships. Uh, this new design infused a steady stream of these radiogenic isotopes directly into the matter portion of the matter antimatter stream. Uh, and this then in the actual warp reaction magnified it, um, generating a far greater power output. And this was equivalent to the later on galaxy class warp engine design, um, but far less stable as the reaction was only a partially controlled one. And after a few major incidents, this technology proved fundamentally flawed and was abandoned in favour of their artificial singularity research. The ship design was also very unique in the Romulan fleet, having a secondary warp drive pod located at the top of the ship, which could be used to power the vessel effectively even after separation occurred, meaning both halves of the ship still maintained warp capability. While it was designed to work independently, it could still be tied into the primary warp core and used in conjunction with the main warp drive. By doing this, the ship could achieve its maximum warp speed of warp 8 for six hours before the enhanced warp core had to be completely shut down and allowed to cool, since the intermix chamber would reach extremely high levels of both heat and radiation. This left the ship vulnerable and detectable, even when cloaked, as the additional shielding did little to contain this radiation. This was a definite weakness in, des in the design of the ship. The ship had two separate impulse drives consisting of three engines. One large drive located at the back of the main hull and two smaller ones at the rear of each wing. As far as warp goes, the ship had a maximum speed of warp 8 for six hours, as Stewart just said, a maximum safe speed of warp 6 with cloak engaged, and a recommended safe cruising speed of warp 5. And, of course, its battle-ready speed of warp 2.5, which allowed weapons to be fully charged, shields on standby, and a fully operational cloak. This was used for quick strike attacks and was basically what the ship was designed for. So, yeah, like, warp in, decloak, fire plasma torpedoes and disruptors on the unsuspecting target before they could raise shields, and then either destroy them or board them. The terror bird in action, everyone. So it sounds like you're getting a bit excited about weapons there, Stuart. So might as well talk about the armaments of the Terror Bird. Yeah, it had two uh, primary forward-facing plasma torpedo banks, which could accumulate or focus the plasma into one large torpedo of varying strengths as needed. This build-up uh, occurred around a specially designed crystal emitter array constructed to resemble the beak of the Terror Bird. There were two forward-facing wing-mounted disruptor cannons, which were very similar to what the Derodex used, which deployed on the interior tips of the wings and focused energy directly from the warp themselves. This was much like the 1701 refit that fed phaser power through the warp engines to increase energy output, and having those disruptors built this way gave them even more punch than the refit. Oh, wow. <laughs> the ship had a total of six disruptor pulse turrets, three forward-facing, two on top, one on the bottom, another one on each side, and one aft next to the shuttle bay. These turrets are more of a point defense weapon designed to weaken enemy plasma torpedoes, intercept photon torpedoes, or take out threats such as shuttlecraft or fighters that may get too close. There are also three aft-facing micro-torpedo launchers, which can focus their plasma output, again, like the front, front ones, to form a larger plasma torpedo of varying strength. The longer the buildup, the more powerful the torpedo would be. This buildup could, of course, be done only while decloaked, and since the ship was a first strike weapon, the time it took to charge up the plasma was almost always too long, so they would normally stick to rapid-fire micro-plasma torpedoes, which were very effective. So another distinctive feature is the dual bridge design. While the main command bridge is nestled snugly away in the middle of the ship, it also has a gunnery bridge located in the head of the terror bird that consisted of six, one, six stations, one for each plasma turret as well as a central command position, which allowed for a gunnery commander to stand and coordinate all weapons fire. The secondary bridge can be used as an emergency bridge, uh, should the main bridge or auxiliary control become damaged. Cool. So now to the cloaking system of this beast. Um, this terror bird is outfitted with the first uh, new line of enhanced Ferritus dual emitter cloaking devices, named after the ship's creator. Yeet. 
<laughs> uh, this means each cloaking device is in fact two emitters which help cloak a different frequency of matter. So running both concurrently requires less power and gets a far more refined result with less radioactive emissions. The terror bird, as we said, can separate into two major sections. Each has its own cloaking device. Should neither rise to separate, each ship can still maintain a full stable cloak and walk away. However, these units are primarily used in conjunction when the ship is under normal operation. Both cloaking devices create a cloaking field which intersects, allowing for better output, lower energy consumption and increased performance. Plus, in the event of one becoming damaged, there's redundancy, and while one cloak is not as effective as both combined, it's about as effective as the old TOS star, so it's still pretty effective. The new system reduced tachyon emissions by an additional 50% over older cloaking systems. This means that when the ship was in full stealth mode and running at peak efficiency, the ship was about 90% undetectable to standard sensor systems of the time. However, a well-equipped science ship or ship outfitted with a specialized sensor palette could in fact narrow down the ship's location if looking for specific tachyon emissions or displaced antiprotons, or while the Terrorbird was at warp, as was the problem with most Romulan ships, such as the TNG Warbird. However, upon dropping out of warp and initiating full stealth protocols, the ship was extremely difficult to pinpoint. The ship had a complement of three standard shuttles and two troop transports, as well as a reconfigurable shuttle, which could be used as a sensor decoy or a suicide shuttle. Now, these sensor decoys and suicide shuttles are frequently used in Starfleet battles. The sensor decoy shuttles are very effective at either scrambling enemy sensor systems, making lock-on to the Terror Bird nearly impossible, uh, which aided the craft if they become damaged or detected too early. The suicide shuttle is exactly what it sounds like, and was a last defense weapon launched fully loaded with armaments that either impacted with enemy shields, causing massive damage, or were used more as a proximity-type mine. When the ship moved too close, well, you get the idea. And were these ships manned, Stuart, do you think, or not? Depends on the race. And um, for the Romulans? With the Romulans, I would say no. Okay. They wouldn't be manned. So, uh, we mentioned that only three of these ships ever constructed, um, and that this new engine design ended up being a failure. So, well, the Terror Bird was a mixed bag, and it's worth pointing out exactly what happened to these, well, only three vessels that were ever constructed. So the first vessel was launched as a response to the Enterprise B and was tasked to stalk the ship, destroying settlements in neighboring sectors, similar to Balance of Terror. It was a test of the ship's cloak and stealth mode. Despite several close calls, the Terror Bird performed flawlessly. The Telshiar launched its sister ships within 12 months, and emboldened by their success, they set each ship to take on a different enemy. The prototype stayed in Federation space, tasked with the disruption of major dilithium trade routes. The second ship was sent to destroy shipyards and important tactical installations in Gorn space. And the third was sent to Tholian space to weaken their forces as a first strike to eventually retake a number of systems lost over the decades. So each of these ships had an experienced Tal Shiog crew. However, each had different strategies. Um, these ships are stealth strike cruisers, not battleships. And while they might be armed to the teeth, the power cores become far more unstable the more power uh, and the more you tax it. So, yeah, so the ship that was sent to Tholian space, yeah, it tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the entire fleet of Tholian ships. Uh, yeah, and in the process, it overloaded the warp core, causing catastrophic failure, and the commander had no choice but to self-destruct in order to avoid being captured. So, great job, guys. The Gorn also proved more resourceful. While the Terrorbird was destroying tactical installations and shipyards, the Gorn worked out that it was, in fact, a cloaked ship. They created a rudimentary sensory net, uh, much like they did in TNG with Sela, and in an ambush, the Gorn ships got a few good hits on them using their very powerful Gorn plasma torpedoes, which disabled the cloak, and once that was down, well, the ship really wasn't designed to be in an actual fight. It was designed to neutralize an enemy in its first strike, so it didn't last long against their ships, and was oh. destroyed with the loss of all hands. All those Gorns. <laughs> While this was going on, the Tal Shiar decided that the Terror Bird should finally engage the Enterprise B. So they ambushed the Enterprise, um, but while the Terror Bird was stalking them for, for so many weeks, the Enterprise B actually managed to isolate what little radiation was being given off. Um, so they managed to raise shields as the Terror Bird decloaked and survived the first hit, and that's, that's, that's not good for, for the battle. Well, it is good for Federation, but not good for Romulans. Sorry, Michael. Um, <laughs> So Captain Harriman took this opportunity to get a good shot before the ship could recloak. 
But this shot ripped through the hull and damaged some power conduits, so they couldn't keep the cloak going for much longer. And after they exchanged one weapons barrage, yeah, they just they just couldn't keep going, so the Terrorbird was forced to retreat. Yes, yeah, so their arrogance was their undoing, and the Federation could never work out who attacked them. The prototype Terrorbird, having failed the mission it was built for, was sent off to finish the mission in Tholian space, and that was the last that the ship was ever seen. So it was 40 years later, a single damaged suicide shuttle was discovered from this ship. It had been floating through space, its systems fried, but the Romulans managed to get a few bits of information from its memory banks. It would seem that the Romulans had launched it in the last few minutes before the ship's disappearance. The ship was heavily damaged, and the shuttle was launched as a last resort weapon in an attempt to cause damage to the Tholian vessel nearby. But it never finished its mission that it was sent to do. But this time, there's some kind of energy pulse, and then an unknown spatial disturbance, and that's it. That's the last we heard of it. Uh, we don't know what happened, but due to molecular damage um, of the hull of the shuttle, we theorise that potentially it winked into a parallel dimension, but we don't know. This is all speculation, um, and it could still be out there somewhere. We just don't know, and probably never will. What is it with these Tholians and their web and distorting space? <laughs> they got to stop that. It's bad for the environment. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but yeah, it would be cool to see this terror bird show up again years later. Somewhere. Somewhere out there. <laughs> okay, guys, now it's time for the behind-the-scenes portion of the show. And since we have the creator of this fantastic ship with us, we will ask him a few questions. So, Michael, when did you first start designing this ship, and how long did it take you from initial concept to finished design? Well, that's a good question there, Stuart, because uh, this actually started back in the mid-'80s uh, when some friends of mine were playing Starship Starfleet battles, mm. and they asked me to sort of come up with some interesting Romulan designs. Uh, the process of making the ship model itself really started in a woodworking class where I was just whittling a piece of pine and started with the head and gradually over the years worked my way down from the, the head to the neck to the body uh, not really knowing what the ship itself was going to look like. It was a very organic process for me so there were some things that I, I added and took off, didn't like, liked, tweaked. Um, so yeah, that was generally how that, that, that went down. So that would have been probably 1987 to 2013. Oh, wow. wow. Longer development period than most ships in Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, you got a week to do this. Come on now. <laughs> so the actual physical model uh, is about 17 inches from wingtip to tail and is extremely light. Uh, can you tell us, Michael, what materials used to create this model? Well, there are a lot of materials. Like I said, the head is made out of pine. The uh, the main hull is made out of balsa. There's uh, a sculpting material called Sculpey. Uh, sheet styrene, paper clips, um, twist ties. There's all kinds of materials there, and there's some elements of other ships that I that I kick bash that are uh, giving some of the details. The uh, the Greedleys, they're called. This the sort of technical sort of hodgepodge mechanical parts. If you wanted to look at the model, they're the inside wing. Oh, I got the model right here, actually. <laughs> he Sorry, I forgot all about that. Here. Yes, yes, you did. <laughs> so this part here? Ah. Yeah, those are those are called Greedleys. Mm -hmm. uh, they came from the Star, the star Wars. Uh, it was a Star Destroyer yeah. that it came from. Ah, and the sense. weapon turrets themselves hmm. are also from Star Destroyers. Well... We'll have better graphics at the side there. <laughs> All right, so we know you've had this model for some time. Did you ever think it would ever get this star treatment like it has here on Trek Yards? I mean, this thing is amazing. How excited are you to have this, like, actual specs and a story and such? Well, I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am. I really didn't think it was going to go anywhere other than on display on a shelf in my home. So I am uh, tickled Romulan green. Uh, <laughs> over that so yeah i really appreciate it and the efforts that you guys have made really make it all worthwhile appreciate it <laughs> but uh i've got to ask and stuart wrote this in the script just just want to point this out how was it working with stuart and i doing this process i mean was it enjoyable was it was it really really enjoyable and and would you recommend that other people come to us with a unique ship uh and maybe have the trek yards team build the ship and side cannon i mean we're here for that sort of thing so what would you say uh, michael well, uh, once you get over the egos, everything was fantastic. 
hard. I really didn't have any sort of trouble at all. I mean, they were very. You guys were really flexible. Yeah, you asked for my input consistently, which I loved, and a lot of the canon I really think is spot on. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out the fantastic 3D model we had created. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah, uh, it was created by Mario Marino. Yeah, he's a 3D artist. They'll actually be joining us in a future episode because he has his own ship design uh, uh -huh. and I'll be joining Trek Cars Original. Uh, we approached him and he was really pleased to work with us. Uh, he took photos that we'd taken of the actual model and then made a 3D model of it. And, and I think we're all proud of it. It's such a cool, cool looking thing. And uh, for me, uh, probably for you guys as well, it was very surreal to see something that was actually just a physical model and now it's flying through space. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it was great. <laughs> um, Mario sent us this quote. Working on this model with only photographs of the physical model for reference was very challenging, but also a lot of fun. The distortion caused by perspective is something you have to take into consideration. I have a lot of appreciation for all the work that went into the original Terror Bird and look forward to similar projects in the future. So, Michael, what was it like to see your Terror Bird in space, as it were, for the first time? I can't put it into words, to be frank. It was just amazing. It's something that I've always imagined and uh, now it's come to fruition uh, thanks to you guys i mean just amazing i really love it all right guys so now it's the discussion part of the show um so we're going to talk about first about what we love about the ship um, i think that the profile of this thing is amazing uh, it looks very menacing and warlike also the fact that it's from an era that we didn't see any romulan designs and wouldn't until tng when the federation said they hadn't seen anything from the romans for about 80 years Except, of course, the Bird of Prey from Star Trek III, which was originally a Romulan design that Krug and his men had stolen. And then after they changed the script, they decided to make, to make it a Klingon ship, and they didn't even change the looks, the looks of it at all. Which makes me maintain that the Bird of Prey is 100% a Romulan design that the Klingons acquired during their truce and technological exchange with the Romulans. I'm with you there, Captain. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, I know Samuel disagrees with this, yes, obviously, I do. Come on. <laughs> but even he can't be perfect, even though he is British. <laughs> uh, so the fact that you made something uh, from this era was just great to see. And all the callbacks and visual cues that tie it together with the Bird of Prey, as well as future Romulan ships, are just fantastic. Plus, when Samuel and I were fleshing this ship out, the dimensions you gave it, and just everything about it really was just perfect. The size, the dimensions, the look, the feel, the color. Uh, you just hit the nail on the head. Uh, bravo. Good good job, man. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had the pleasure to work with this ship in 3D, um, build its flybys and get a, a greater sense of this ship. And it really is a fantastic design. Fits into the era perfectly, I think. Shows an evolution to TNG. And as Stuart said, the scale. I mean, once we finalized exactly what scale was, everything was just right. The turrets, the plasma torpedo tubes. It all just worked. Uh, a tricky thing to get right, so well done, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I love the feel of this ship. It, it's aggressive yet elegant. Um, and I know I'm biased, but I love all the information we worked out. It really fits into canon, and it would have been great to see this in the show. It really would have. Uh, I think my favourite thing would just have to be the overall design. I know it's a cop-out, but I just think it all works so well together. So. so Michael, if you had to pick one thing specifically that you love about this ship, one thing. what would it be? Uh, well, I'd have to say where it started, which was the head. Uh, it really was not intended to become a ship. I, I was in a woodworking class and had a block of pine that I was that I was carving away at. And I really feel like it really gives it a lot of personality. And uh, the, the, the integration of the, uh, the torpedo bays, I think, is uh, really unique because... We've only seen them integrated in the past with Klingon ships, and they only ever have one bay. And this particular design has two flanking bays on the side of it. So I'd have to say that that element of the design is my favorite. Cool. Okay, so now it comes to the part of the show where we say what we don't like about it. Sorry, Michael. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but to be honest, there isn't too much. Uh, if I had to say something that I didn't really like too much, it would be the dorsal view from the top. Where and where the wings attach, it just seems it's, it wasn't bulked up enough. It looks kind of weak in that spot. Don't be eight brain, Stuart. Don't be eight brain. <laughs> I know, I know. Thank you, Doug Drexler. <laughs> However, this is made up for by the profile view that I discussed a minute ago. Also, I feel the shuttle bay might need a little work as it's just a, merely an Excelsior class shuttle bay door. Um, if you could redesign that and make the shuttle bay a bit bulkier and have a new redesigned door, that, that would look awesome, I think. 
But aside from that, I think it's an absolutely fantastic ship, and I think you should be designing starships for a living. Thank you. Yeah, and as for me, I, what can I say about I don't like? I you have to pick something, don't you? It's always the, always a problem with these things. Uh, if it had to be something, probably the large impulse engine at the back. It, it, it'd be cool to see it a bit more advanced, maybe lit up rather than just grills. But that's really it. Um, is there anything I don't really like? Um, sorry, I, it's just so cool to see it fly in my renders. That's that. I'm stop. I'm stopping at that, Stuart. So now you make me sound like the asshole by saying <laughs> things that I didn't like, and you're like, oh, what that I didn't like. All right. Well, Michael, if there's anything you could change about it, um, or you know, change if you did a refit of it, let's say, what would it be? <laughs> well, uh, specifically the things that you guys mentioned, um, I don't think I would change the placement of the the wings that support the nacelles. I purposely uh, wanted it to appear that they were at the back portion of the ship, not in the middle of it. Mm. Um, there is a cantilever design. The tail actually balances out the two wings. So that's not something I would change. And the shuttle bay, uh, that, again, it is a kit bash. Uh, like I said, it's a very organic process that I went through. I thought I needed something more rounded at the bottom, and I just thought that that fit really well into the, the sort of that feel. Uh, again, it is at the bottom. Uh, it is also reversed in the way that it would be for the Excelsior. So the rounded dome-like shape is at the bottom, where on the Excelsior it would be at the top. Mm. Uh, and as far as the impulse engine, a lot of what I was thinking of was them having physical armor as mm -hmm. part of their defense. Mm -hmm. So that large bulky grill is also designed to help resist any sort of strikes that might hit it at its impulse. Great answer. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it's time of the, that time of the show for verses, everybody. Uh -huh. Who wants to do a verses? I, mean, I do. I do. I do. Okay. <gasps> well, uh, I think it should be both of us. Me and Stuart versus Michael and his ship. Because it's such a cool, powerful ship. I think we'll need to combine all of our might uh, to go against him. So, uh, Stuart, why don't you take a Bird of Prey, a Burrell class from roughly the same era. And I'll take a more, more advanced Vorcha. I have a Vorcha, so this one. Oh, I have a Bird of Prey. How how convenient. Yeah, um, Yeah. so <laughs> slightly more powerful attack cruiser on my end. And then a slightly weaker sort of stealth scout on your end. And, and see what happens. Michael, what, 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 let's we, do it. what are we doing then? What's happening, Michael? Uh, well, I think I would start with the uh, Vorcha class. And, yeah. <laughs> so I would be probably uh, hitting that with... I'd probably flank it to one side. Not knowing, like, I'm not sure where the other... Where the bird of prey is. Oh, we're flying side by side right now. And you're coming out of... You're coming out behind us, let's say. It's decloaking. Because we're just doing our patrol. We're just cruising along. Okay. So what I would probably do is come in from underneath and use the side cannons to target the Vorcha. Oi. And, and then speed past them. And as I'm targeting the Vorcha, build up an aft torpedo burst mm. to hit the Bird of Prey would be where I would start off. Well, I, I got to say, as soon as we see you decloak, uh, we've got a couple seconds. You're firing at the Vorcha with the disruptors first. So my little bird of prey is going to start cloaking and bank to the left. Veer off. Cloaked, gone. Come out behind you. Of course, you've got your plasmas charging, which you just said. Well, I've, I've got to ask, Mike, so where did you hit the Vorcha? Because, I mean, what sort of damage are we looking at? I mean, these are some reasonably high-powered disruptors, but where did you hit? Uh, my target probably would have been the right side warp nacelle. Okay. So I'm kind of damaged, but I'm, weapons are probably still be quite functional, so I'm probably retargeting you as you're banking towards the bird of prey, so I'm probably going to start firing disruptors, if I can, and, and I'm sure you're going to start dodging them, but yeah, Stuart, what are you going to do? Well, I've cloaked, like I said, I'm coming up behind him. Um, I know I have noticed he's building up a plasma torpedo charge in the back there, and that's not good. So... Uh, I'm going to swoop down underneath them and cloak, do a quick turn, and end up decloaking face to face with them. Oh. <laughs> and I'm still firing disruptors trying to hit you, so I'm slowly coming after you at sort of half impulse. So, what are you going to so do? We assume, we assume you've like stopped to so like charge up your shields, and you know, and I'm face to face with you. He's firing at you. What's next? Uh, well, what we would probably do is uh, go with 
two torpedoes from the front and the front mounted uh, disruptor cannons directly at the bird of prey. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small one after all. It's a Burrell. Could, could you not dodge a little bit, Stuart, and at least survive oh, yeah. it? I, mean, I would be doing some <laughs> some evasive maneuvers there. Um, I'm sure my shields are fairly weak at this point. Probably got some internal damage. But I would uh, definitely do some evasive maneuvering and kind of swoop underneath you, try to cloak again. I assume my cloak is still working. Did you manage to get any torpedoes off to damage Michael ship? Oh, yeah. I, 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 would, I would think I would fire at least one when I decloaked. <laughs> So, I mean, you got, like, 10% damage to your front shield. Well, remember, it's not Actually, fine. shields what? shields were nothing we really even talked much about, really, were we? Well, it, again, it's about power management. So do you want shields yeah. or do you want weapons? That's sort of the, the question, isn't it? Well, it would probably be about weapons to attempt to destroy the smaller ship first yep. and then focus on shields against the larger so ship. So I can imagine sure. that torpedo do some actually kind of serious damage and start... start causing inspiration leak. So I'm I'm now coming I'm quite a powerful beefy ship, so I'm coming in, I'm firing all weapons, I'm hitting your back shields. So now you've been attacked from both sides. You think your your shields are starting to buckle a bit, but you've still got some powerful weapons. What do you think you're gonna do? Mm. Uh well what we will probably try to do is uh get some evasive action going on there and uh see if there's any way to reactivate the cloak. Okay, so we're assuming the cloak's not damaged and you start to decloak, or start to recloak, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go beam Stuart's crew aboard, apart from the captain, because he obviously wants to go down <laughs> the ship, so I'm, I'm there safe. Stuart's gonna, probably going to die, but you know. Why would you dishonor them by giving them life after they Because been... you've killed loads of my people already, I need more crew members. I'm, I'm, I'm... That's a good point. You know, that's, that's kind of rude, Samuel. <laughs> Let my crew die with some honor and some dignity. Fine, I'll blow up your dollar. Sure. Stovacore! Uh, Oh, I, I would assume that my ship is like damaged and probably, even though it's cloaked, it's still emitting large amounts of radiation because of the damage. So I decide to decloak or decloak again, and get a few shots off with my can my my wing mounted guns. You know, as you're cloaking, kind of give you a little kick in the ass. And uh, yeah, I don't know what to do from there. So Samuel, what are you going to be doing right at this point? Well, I'm just scanning around trying to find him. He's not damaged enough to create any sort of major a leak, and you've already compromised my power systems with, the, with a pretty devastating shot to my uh, warp engine. So I'm just sort of keep weapons on standby. Really, I don't know. Are you are you retreating yet, or are you going to try one last attack, Michael? Uh, well, I'm trying to get a read on your systems to see where you know what's been affected by the strike to the uh, to the nacelle. Um, I would probably try to come in at some obscure angle, maybe upside down. <laughs> Your pattern indicates three-dimensional thinking. Mm. <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe see where I could target uh, any sort of command functions, whether it be the bridge or impulse drive. So would you shoot at my ship as well again? I'm thinking it's pretty much going to be out of uh, out of commission. It's not, so not going to focus too much on it at this point. Not yet. I still got some a little bit but fight. I'm, I just I'm, fired at you as you were cloaking. So, I mean, come on, you've got to like. I know, but I've got some big beefy guns. I'm obviously the bigger threat. So if you, if you do successfully strike maybe this portion, I think I'm probably looking at starting to have shield failure, especially if you have to get a plasma torpedo off. I think maybe mm -hmm. at that point I'm going to start firing. I'm going to devote all powered weapons and just shoot everything I have. But that's going to start destabilizing my power grid and, and, and the damage is going to be a bit too much. Maybe they're going to fry out. I think I've probably damaged you quite a lot at this point. Like, you've probably lost your disruptors and some of your some of your turrets. But I think I'm probably now going to start not maybe not thinking about retreating, but maybe diverting power to shields and seeing if I can escape, because we're both yeah. at a point where if we really want to destroy the other, I think we can, but maybe at the risk of each of ourselves, if that makes sense. you got to remember, too, we mentioned that his is a strike attack. Like, it's not meant to be an actual battle. It's this is a strike. battle cruiser, so this is a... yeah. yeah. So I, I think my ship right now, what I'm going to do, the honorable thing, is warp right through you. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and we're going to Stovacor. I don't know where you're going, man. Well, we're going to drink that. That's got to pulverize your shield Blood system. Line. Okay. Well, hopefully there's enough space between me and the, the larger ship. I'll try to time it to move out of the way at the last second, oh. allowing your bird of hey, prey to slam you're into a huge your ship. He's a very there. small ship. I think he's got you at that. You're a very large ship, you know. It's probably well, it's all about you. timing, right? <laughs> Are you warp speed fast? You got that kind of reflexes? Oh. Well, you're, you're veering towards me at warp speed. Well, you got to see something. I'm not veering towards. I came up behind you, decloaked, fired yeah. as you were cloaking, and then, and then 
Yeah. When you declose, and just boom, right into you. Well, that's when I took an obscure angle and moved out of the path well, of your path ship. Of it's still going to hit you. I guarantee the wing would still hit your 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 aft. I think your impulse engines are probably, or your your, your aft warps probably now going to be hit quite uh, dramatically and rip right through that hull armor. Anyway, I'm in still the car. I don't give a shit what happens from here. That's true. Uh, <laughs> so, so both quite damaged, Michael. Do you wanna do you wanna keep going toast over the battle cruiser or retreat as you are a strike cruiser? Well, I think probably some of our nifty little shuttles Ooh. could start being deployed. That's true. And uh, we could start setting up some decoys. Okay. We'll see how your ship reacts to those. I can't. I just gotta keep firing weapons. I can't do much. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have a target. Well, I have little targets. Yeah, you should like launch a d decoy shuttle and then cloak and mm. get out with your ship intact. I think because it is a prototype. So have him, you know, unless, look for you. Unless, unless he wants to risk it all and come behind me and just fire everything while still getting hit by my aft torpedoes, probably destroying the back of my ship and causing a warp core explosion. But I think you'd you probably lose the the front of your ship and that and that, that darn battle bridge. But you probably win. So are you are you, are you <laughs> willing to risk it? I could always separate. Oh. Huh. Well, I don't know, man. I don't know how to call this one. We should probably wrap it up, though. Yeah. Um, I think it, it was, was a fair, I think it was a fairly effective strike on your behalf, you know, Michael. I think, and I think no one got out of that alive, maybe apart from that one shuttle. <laughs> hey, there's that mystery shuttle again, right? <laughs> hey, cool. Okay. Wow, guy, that was a really fun episode. Um, not only the filming, but just everything and just everything about it was awesome. The discussion Samuel and I had about the ship and how things just fell into place was just great. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to doing more Trek Yards Originals with you guys and all of your unique and great designs. As you can see, we really put our heart and soul into it and really get into the meat of the details. So this ship, in my mind now, is a real ship in canon. And the way we approached it made it, made it seem that it, it makes sense that it wasn't mentioned or seen in canon. So that's what we tr are going to endeavor to do with these originals, guys. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for designing this ship and allowing us to add our Trek Yards flair to it. And of course, for joining us today. Well, I'm really glad I could be here, and I really, I have to agree. I think it feels like a part of Star Trek canon as a result of this. So, kudos to you guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, we couldn't ask for more. Uh, so, would you recommend other people donate to our Trek Yards page and get this star treatment? Was it a fun experience for you? One hundred percent. I totally, I would totally give the thumbs up to anybody else who's interested who have taken the time maybe to think of their own ideas for ship, whether it be, you know, Federation, uh, Klingon, whatever it is, I think they should really look you guys up and, of course, uh, watch Trek Yards. Thank you. Cool. So, there you have it. That's the end of the Terror Bird. Um, and we do have some more originals, Trek Yards originals, coming down the line. Since several of the people actually donated towards our Indiegogo at the 50 or 80, you know, pick your own ship put, they picked their own original design, and that is fantastic. We can't wait to look at it. So, if you do want to see your own ship uh, beyond Trek Yards, do contact us at trekyards at hotmail.com or check out the Trek Yards original page on the trekyards.com website and click the donate button and check out the information to see what we can do. Um, we'd love to discuss your ship uh, with us and work out all the cool stuff. Um, but I'm sure, as you can imagine, this does take a lot of time, especially with 3D modeling and these things. It, it, it It's awesome, but we put a lot of, a lot of work into it. So... If you can, if you want to join, there is some level donation just to help us out, but that gives us the freedom to keep working on it and really do the ship justice, you know, put the same passion that you put into it. So, yeah, like I said, email us at trekkyards at hotmail.com and hopefully, hopefully we can work something out. Yeah, I'm so excited to, to do more of these. So, yeah. and anyways, guys, that's it for another Trek Yards episode. As always, visit the Facebook group as well as trekyards.com to check out other great Trek Yards content. Or simply go to YouTube and search Trek Yards. We have so much stuff to tide you over until we see you again next week. Yeah. Um, till then, this is Captain Foley. Commander Cockings. And our and very special guest designer. Me, Michael Freitas. <laughs> saying, let's see what's out there, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. See you later.